Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I'd like to get our program started. And uh, as I mentioned last month, uh, Pastor Courtney is our liaison to the Discipleship Committee. She's with us again today. And by, I've asked her to uh, bless our food. Sam, can you hear me? Do I, yeah. Yeah. Do I really need the mic? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks to come together this way for fellowship, learning from one another's experiences. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time, that it would be meaningful for all of us, and we just give you thanks for the simple blessing of sharing a meal and fellowship with one another. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the food that we have enjoyed. May it make us strong for your service. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. So I wanted to remind everybody just quickly about our discipleship committee at the church. Um, our mission as followers of Christ is to reach out to the church, spreading the gospel, to strengthen one's faith in, in our God. Together in obedience to God and being faithful to scriptures, we desire to further develop our relationship, not only with our master, but also with our fellow man. Making disciples, teaching one another, we want to assist members of the church by making disciples of our children, youth, and our adults. This series, I think, has been a blessing already for all of us. We've even, we're now meeting, we, we plan to implement a wisdom series for the women in the uh, latter months of uh, October, November, December. So I think we're looking forward to kind of putting that together. And um, you know, we on the committee, we, we believe it's a privilege to be able to be a part of that that committee. And it's a privilege for us also to, to see y'all coming in, gathering, gathering together, ha having our fellowship. Uh, it's really a special, special time. We, you know, we had such a special uh, lesson, I think, from Richard last month of how he served not only Christ through, through the church, but he served our country. I think it was a wonderful uh, testimony. Really, really our speaker today doesn't need much of really an introduction. But I will I will say that you know Jim is a very unique person. I don't know of anybody in our community having lived here all my life who's has a, such a meteoric, meteoric challenge in life. From his position at Williams Steel, being the CEO of H&M Construction, being a, a part of the Jackson Chamber for a number of years. At church, he has served as an elder currently overseeing the endowment fund of our, of our church and also he's, he's in charge of leading our long-range planning so you know sometimes if someone that has a, all those things going for them they need to be reminded to to seek uh, to be humble and Jim did this so so well just a few years ago. He, he needed he, he knew that he needed to get his feet on the ground, be him, and get some humility about himself. So he decided to run for the Jackson Madison County <laughs> School Board. <laughs> of course, he he was easily elected. And eventually, of course, he ascended to the apex of that job as chairman. So, um, 
needless to say, he, he, Jim has always loved to take on a challenge. So, but it's, it's great to have our brother with us and uh, look forward to hearing from Jim today. Thank you so much for that. You know, wisdom would be just saying thank you and sit down. It's not going to get any better. <laughs> uh, I am reminded of that T-shirt that I saw a number of years ago. It says, the older I get, the better I was. And so when I look back on that, that's probably about as good as it gets, too. But Eden, thank you so much for that. Eden and Ty, thank you for putting this thing together. Uh, and thank you all for being here. You know, you no, know, I get in a situation like this always in the back of my mind. I go, gosh, who's going to go here and be talking? So I always wonder, is anybody even going to show up? I really appreciate y'all being here today. Uh, just in in way of a quick background, uh, some months ago, Eden and Ty were floating the idea of this of this series of luncheons, and it was my understanding they were going to ask older guys to come in <laughs> and share you know, their insights. And I, I said, this is a fantastic idea. I said, man, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I had no idea that they were going to put me in that group of being an older guy in the first place. Mm -hmm. I had no idea I'd be standing up here as a part of this. <clears throat> and and Richard, it was certainly before they called this the Wisdom Series and told me I was going to be following you in this thing. <laughs> and I called him. I said, Eden, that is not Richard. <coughs> follow Richard's wife up here like this. Uh, but I finally got okay with it. Not comfortable, uh, but okay. I can't get comfortable. I've got my first Sunday school teacher. I've got my current Sunday school teacher back there, Steve Bowers, and our associate minister. So how can I be comfortable <laughs> talking about my faith journey? But I finally got okay with it. Uh, and, and my thinking was this. This uh, <clears throat> breaks into two big buckets, I think. What you should do and what you should not do. And I finally said, you know, <coughs> I'm willing to be really candid and honest in reflections on my life. Maybe I can bring value to this thing, but definitely going to be in the bucket over here of what not, what not to do. <laughs> and I, I, and I, hope, I hope it is helpful. Uh, for those of you who weren't at our last meeting, uh, Richard made the point that the process of building a relationship with Jesus Christ is a, is a gradual process. Uh, and, that's, and that's true. Uh, I, that process I refer to, like I think many Christians do, as my journey, my faith journey, my spiritual journey. And I think that's what most Christians think of. And I found that journey on uh, the, the prayer that Jesus was having with his disciples at the Last Supper. Uh, and if you recall, he, he was praying and he said, Father, this is eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. And I said, that, that makes sense to me. I believe that's going to be the foundation of my journey. And I've come to add to that a little bit. And I, but my, my goal with my journey is to know God better so I can love him more deeply and follow him more closely. And I know uh, that the road, the avenue to do that is through my relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm getting way ahead of myself uh, because it was years and years and years before I figured out that I needed to be on a journey and figure out what that journey, <coughs> journey looked like. Uh, in, in spite of growing up in, in a great church, First Presbyterian, from the time I was in the third grade, in spite of uh, a loving, nurturing uh, church family, in spite of great Sunday school teachers, uh, who had, in spite of loving parents uh, who were very, very faith-oriented, uh, the whole concept of spirituality just was not connected. Uh, I graduated from high school, uh, went to the University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville for four years, and never thought about going to church, never thought about any kind of relationship 
with Jesus Christ. Uh, I attended Knoxville uh, on an Army scholarship, so right at graduation I was commissioned in the Army and went into the Army for seven years. And for that whole time, I never thought about, never even thought about going to church, never even thought about any kind of personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as bad as all of that sounds, it gets worse. <laughs> because uh, in, in the late 70s, uh, Dad had about four partners with him at William Steele, and we all grown up working at William Steele. And he called us, he said, he said, boys, he said, uh, uh, my partner's ready to sell this company. They're looking for buyers, and if you ought to even think you want to come back, now's the time. You better make up your mind. So uh, my brothers and I talked, my owner and I talked, and we decided, yep, yeah, that's, what, that's what we want to do. And so uh, in 1979, I resigned my commission uh, in the Army. My owner and I moved back to Jackson, uh, rolled up my sleeves, and very, very quickly, work became the central focus of my life. It was practically all consuming for me for many, many years. I say practically because Mona and I started our family. We had two wonderful children, and I would carve out time for the family. But that was it. Uh, other than that, my focus was on work. Uh, and, and in my defense, that, that was not driven by, by greed or by money. It wasn't driven by ambition. It wasn't driven by recognition or the need for anything like that. I just loved work. I loved being a part of an organization that was running smoothly and functioning smoothly. And I loved being a part of a team that, that, that made that happen. Uh, in, the, in the military, that was the thing I really enjoyed the most was that camaraderie with the officer corps there. And I found that same thing in the team of people uh, that we had uh, in our organization. Start with William Steele and then as it grew to other things, uh, I, I, I quickly, you know, developed this affinity, uh, loyalty, and sense of accountability to that team that was really all consuming to me. And, uh, and still, we just got fantastic teams of people. Uh, it was really a privilege to work with, to serve with. Um, we we quickly got into this pattern. Uh, we company would be running smooth, the organization would be running smooth, and then an opportunity would pop up. And our team would, would you, you know, if we didn't want to lose that opportunity, our team would rise to that challenge. Uh, we, we, would, we would absorb that opportunity. There would be a period where it was rough and we were going up a learning curve. Uh, but very quickly things would smooth out. Things would be running smooth again, and then boom, here comes another opportunity, and the cycle repeated itself. And it repeated itself over and over and over again for many, many years. Uh, and it was wonderful. It was great. It was exhilarating. It was, uh, I love the challenge. I love working with people like that. Uh, and, and a lot of fulfillment out of that. But the problem was with that, that I had no room, no time for God in my life, and no time for a relationship with Jesus. Um, you know, Mona and I, as soon as we came back, we started going to church. Right? <coughs> uh, but in all of that, I, I was never present to God when I was sitting there. Uh, even for those three hours a week, I was sitting in there in my mind, sitting in the pew, and I was thinking about what happened last week, what's going to happen this week. Even in Sunday school class, uh, my mind was what was going on. Don, you, you remember, you, you know, I was what you call a wall hanger. I got to get in the very back of the sun for the time. Hope, hope nobody caught on me because it did have no idea what was going on. And I was thinking about what was going to, what was going to be happening next week at work. Um, I, I believed in God. And I believed in God's love. But to me, it was kind of a bland, generic, universal, God loves mankind type of love. Um, it was always God loves us, but he's got these expectations of it. And, and, and I came to kind of my perception of God 
was, was more of a judge. Not a bad judge, not, not an unreasonable judge, but a judge. And these expectations he had over there, what, what, he, what, uh, what he wanted to see us, what he wanted to see us do. And so I fell into the, fell into the trap, I guess, of saying, you know what, I think I can meet those expectations by being what I call the Ten Commandments type guy. You know, you look at the Ten Commandments, and really, I did a pretty good job of staying within those boundaries. Uh, with the exception, with the exception of not working on Sunday. Other than that, I stayed in those boundaries, but when you, when you look at them, they're really not very challenging. I mean, you not that much struggle to stay in. And so, I, I, I was comfortable, you know, I had, I had a guy over here that was big, and I was meeting his expectations without a lot of trouble. Uh, I, had him, I had him in a pretty pretty tight little box there, uh, and, and had, that, had that up on the shelf. And I, I very intentionally said, there's no place for God in the workplace. Uh, and, and, you know, I look back on that, and I go, God, that. But, but I, at the time, I think my thinking was, first of all, I didn't know the difference in spirituality and religion. Uh, and, and I think it was kind of an extension of the separation of church and state and all that, you know. We, we, we need to keep that separate over here. This is, this is work. This is, this is the organization, and here's what. We, we don't want to get that all mixed up in. Um, and so, things like that rocked over my prayer life was, was that quick, quick Lord's Prayer at night. Um, I did, I did say every night th uh, prayer thanking God for Mona. And uh, for those of you who know Mona, you, you understand that. But other than that, I had no, no prayer life and absolutely no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And things worked, things worked on right for many, many years until, until I got to my out of mid to late fifties. And then I just started, I just started getting this sense that something was missing. I didn't know what it was, but I just had this feeling that I was missing something. Uh, I knew God had created us, but I, but I started asking for, for, for what purpose. Am I ready here just to? Do one more job, one more, more project, one more opportunity, one more whatever. Uh, I took a quick assessment of my life and I said, it doesn't get any better than this. Uh, Mona and I have been married for about 35 years and still cherished every minute with her. Uh, by the way, we're, we're celebrating our 50th uh, this uh, this fall and, and still, still cherish every, every minute. Two wonderful children. Business great, health great. What, what more could I ask for? Uh, but yet, th there was something out there that, that I knew I was missing. Uh, years later, uh, I read a quote by Augustine that really nailed it. It said, the heart is restless until it rests in God. And that nailed me perfectly during that period. I was just restless and unsettled. Uh, I started. I started reading. I started started reading scripture. I started reading books on spirituality. Uh, and, and and during that time, honestly, the more I read, the more confused I got. Uh, the more questions I had, the more things I didn't understand about uh, you know uh, how God worked and what 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 that was all about. Now. Fortunately, during that time, as I look back, it's clear to me now, God started pinging me with messages and, and on his love. And it was coming from the most friends I had. Believe it or not, it was coming, coming from work. That's another old story I can tell sometimes. And all of these inputs I started getting from work on God's love were just, just amazing. But also coming from my, from my church. I got into a fantastic Sunday school class that Steve Bowers teaches, and and John White came to our church in 2003, and 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 John started preaching God's love, God's love, God's love. Uh, how many times have we heard him close a service with, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, just know that God loves you. 
more than you could possibly imagine. And so the message and the, and the interaction with people in the state of Sunday school class, messages from the pulpit, it finally started sinking in with me. Uh, and finally it just occurred to me, Jim, this is all about one thing. It's about God's love. And it's not that bland, kind of universal love that I had limited God to before. And this is why I struggle with the right words, but it, but it was about that, that wonderful, that glorious, uh, that, that unconditional, unfathomable, uh, eternal, vast, infinite love that God has for me personally. Uh, and, and, and his desire that I receive that love and I accept it and in turn love him and love my brothers and sisters. And I know that's that. So it's so sad. God love each, love God and love each other. It's so simple, but it's it's so all encompassing in my mind. And with infinite, infinite uh, layers of richness in terms of the depths of the knowledge and understanding and experience of these lives and, and the opportunities for increasing levels of, of intimacy in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and, you know, I think about it and I go, God just doesn't get any better than this. We've got the creator of the world. Most powerful thing you can imagine. He knows me personally and loves me with love that I can't even conceive. John, I don't uh, close one of his sermons one time. He said, if we as Christians really understand the message of the gospel, why don't we just walk around on cloud nine with a silly grin on our face all the time? And that, and that you know, I thought about that. And I said, it's got a point. Uh, I, I started going back and revisiting all of these things that are these questions and blanks that I had that, and concerns that when I was starting to do this study and for most of them, for many of them, all of a sudden those questions were answered, uh, uh, concerns addressed, blanks filled in, uh, dots connected, uh, all in the context of God's love. Now, not all of them, I, uh, you know, I still have things that I don't understand. Uh, they're not clear to me. But you know, I, I know God will reveal those to me when he thinks I'm ready. And in the meantime, I don't worry about it. I mean, I'm just totally confident in his love. And I'm, not, I'm just not, I'm not going to waste any, any time worrying about that. Uh, just a few thoughts on that. Love is a really many facets of love. Uh, Paul does a great job in that, you know, his letter to the Corinthians when he spells out what love is, you know, love is patient. Love is kind, it's not proud, it's not self-seeking. It's that section you hear read at weddings a lot of times. Uh, and that's really, really helpful in understanding love. But I've come to believe that in its essence, uh, love, it, it involves coordination of the self to the point of self-sacrifice. I believe it involves that my subordination of my will to God's will, subordination of my self-interest, the self-interest of my brothers and sisters. I believe that that is the love that, that Jesus modeled for us, that he preached to us, and most importantly, that he demonstrated for us in his passion and crucifixion. Um, I believe that the love God calls us to requires action. I believe it's an active love. It's not just a feeling out there. He wants to see us demonstrate with things. I read something one time that, that, uh, that resonated with me. He said, God doesn't necessarily call us to do great things, but rather small things with great love. And that, that, that resonated with me. Um, the, the other thing I can say is I've come to realize how very, very wrong I was to exclude God from the workplace. Uh, whereas I thought there was a place for God there, there's not only a place for him, there is a desperate need for him and for his love and the 
workplace. And I'm finding that more and more people in the workplace crave that and need that. Yeah. We, we, we live balancing a spiritual reality and a physical reality in our lives. And I've come to understand that in no part of our lives that may need to be uh, exclusive, mutually exclusive, uh, either or. But uh, I believe that as long as we're grounded in God's love, guided by the Holy Spirit, those two realities, physical <coughs> and spiritual, can complement each other. And the way that I think, that I hope, is uh, pleasing to God. That, let me just, I, I just kind of conclude with three thoughts. Typically, my daughter always laughs when I say three. She said, you always think in terms of three. I mean, that's all I can remember. I can't remember. I three threes. I said, I'm getting older. Now, those threes are becoming twos. <laughs> but, but just, just I think three, three quick thoughts out there. When I reflect back on all these years that I've missed, that I was, I was not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, Certainly, there's a deep regret, especially now that I know what I'm missing. Uh, that I had to read the pastor that I could be that. That I could be that foolish and that arrogant uh, to not think I needed that. But, but guys, my overwhelming emotion is one of gratitude. Uh, gratitude with God's patience. Uh, and gratitude that you never gave up on. That, that section that I was talking about in Corinthians, where Paul lays out what love is, I don't think it's any accident. It begins with love is patient, and it ends with love always perseveres. And so I will be eternally, I hope, grateful uh, with the fact that God never did it. So, the other thing I would say is that, you, you know, the deeper I get in the relationship with Jesus Christ, the more I realize I fall, short I fall, of the example that he gave to us. You know, it's the Last Supper, he changed the, you know, he raised the ball on that, where it's not love your neighbor yourself, but it's to love each other as I have loved you. And that's a tall bar to, to me. Uh, and Richard, even Paul, you know, I've read where Paul said, why, why do I keep doing the things that I don't do? And I don't do the things that I want to do. Uh, and I'm, I'm dead in that category. It seems like I'm continuously coming to God and asking for His forgiveness for serious shortcomings in my life. Uh, but you know what? I don't do that. With a downcast, forlorn, uh, guilt ridden spirit. Uh, I do it with total confidence in God's love and in His mercy. Uh, God, I believe, loves to forgive me. Maybe I should say, I hope he loves to forgive me. <laughs> but I really think God loves to forgive me. Uh, and by now, you probably already guessed, my image of God has shifted from that of a judge to one of this incredibly loving father. And the, and the last thing I would share with you is that every day, I pray for the Holy Spirit, for his strength, for his guidance, for his wisdom. Uh, and I also pray for the fruit of the Spirit. All, all those things that Paul called out in his letter to the Galatians, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness, self, all those things. But especially, but especially, the joy and the peace. Uh, it's the joy and the peace that I believe God desires for us, that I believe he has planned for us. Uh, and it's, it's the joy and the peace that finally I realize that this world can't give us. And fortunately, this world can't take it away. Um, thank you all so much. I, I hope I had, speaking of patience, I hope I haven't tried to do this too long. But I really appreciate it. Personally, you being here means a lot to me, uh, and I'll leave it at that.
I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I'm not bold enough to ask for questions like Richard did. <laughs> Richard asked for questions. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> So I think we've just witnessed a tremendous loving testimony. I mean, coming from such an icon. And, uh, you know, one of the, back in the late or early spring, we had this Bible study. It was about 16 men. Different, different, had three different groups. And I, I was in the group with Jim. Uh, Jim and I, and then Matt Marino and Russell Cook, we met for eight weeks. And I'm telling you, I, I didn't want to say this at the beginning, because I felt like it would be a big, big part of what Jim said. But every week, reading through those Gospels, eventually, Jim would start talking about God's love. And you know that's that's one of the beauties of men's Bible study, or women's too, is a relationship you develop with one another, not only with the God's word, but with each other. I, I never knew that Jim Campbell would use that word so much, because you know, most men we don't we, we kind of toss that word love around. It we really don't dig into that word much. But it left a big impression on me. And, and the other, these two young men that were with us, we learned a lot from them. They were so transparent. And that's what, that's what happens in, in even meetings like this. Who would have believed that Jim would be so transparent, but in, a, in such an effective manner? So thank you, Jim, for that. You know, we're in, a, in for a treat next month, too. Don Lewis, for many, many years in our community, has been a respected, not only physician, very respected medical person, but also his relationship with his church. So we're, we're in for a, a huge treat again. I mean, we, we've, had, we've had two great visits, two great times to fellowship together. That's what this is about. And next month, we have another great opportunity to hear from one of our own, who uh, we just look forward to hearing from him. So, thanks everybody for coming.